Right, today gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Yvonne Ellsworth. I'm not going to give a pee, and you've, you've seen all this in there, um, who is going to be talking about the heartbeat of the stars. So if those people who've seen gravity will be forgiven t for thinking that you can hear your scream in space, um, <laughs> but that's only if you're inside a space suit. However, there are other ways in which sound travels, and we'll hear some of that today, I hope. Thank you. So welcome to Professor Ellsworth. Well, thank you very much. Um, I obviously need to advance this to the first slide. No, there it is. Good, good. Um, so I guess I should follow on from what Marcus said. Um, I am going to talk about sound waves, but more strictly the effects of sound waves. The sound waves that I'll talk about are trapped inside the sun, trapped inside the stars. Sadly, we don't hear them directly, and we use light as the medium to actually transfer the information to us. So, nice piece of physics to start with. Okay, so um, one of the questions I get asked is in an era when cosmology is turning out such fantastic results, why on earth do we want to study stars? And the answer is, it's fundamental. They're the building blocks in which everything is made. And actually, the advances in trying to understand galaxies are such that they're no longer just considered as a, an amorphous blob of interacting particles, but you actually have to worry about what the constituents are doing. So partly to do with the kind of data that I'll show you, and partly because of advances in theory, um, there is a huge revival in the interest in what stars do. And very nicely, very beautifully, we can actually tell you what's going on inside stars. So what I'm going to talk to you about is getting beyond the surface, getting inside, which is the subject of first solar oscillations. So why they tell you about the sun and then what they tell you, us, about the sun. Um, the solar activity cycle is in an interesting state. We thought we understood it and do we don't. Um, and then I'll take you through to the connections through the stars and the amazing advances that have come from the Kepler mission. And you can't really talk about that unless you, you know, it naturally leads you on to talk about planets and red giants, which are evolved stars like our sun will become. And they're one of the phenomenal success stories of the Kepler mission, somewhat unexpected, they sort of observed them partly because they're nice and bright and they act as position measurers, astrometry, and partly because they couldn't distinguish them from the stars like the sun that they wanted to observe anyway, so they turned up and actually they're stunning, they're amazing. Anyway, um, so um, I'm from the University of Birmingham. Um, people invent logos, okay, so total digression here. When the... Um, publicity people, the advertising people, produced our logo, which is this U and this B, they actually had it off the page on the grounds that, that was, it was so exciting what was in between, it was pushing everything off. And we said to them, well, actually, guys, it looks like your paper's not big enough. <laughs> you know? So we've moved on and just squeezed to the boundaries. So the sun is a star, and it's a variable star. And that actually... Um, is accepted now, but in its time was quite a revolutionary statement because people thought that it was, over short time scales, really quite, con quite constant. We know it varies over very long time scales, but data in the last 25 years have shown it to be really quite variable on short time scales. So um, I start with the unseen interior, Sir Arthur Eddington, um, of great fame, clearly. Um, if any of you saw the television program several years ago now, uh, he wore glasses. And I think he was like my mother. He took his glasses off to be photographed. <laughs> However, um, what he said was that at first sight, it would seem that the deep interior of the sun and stars is less accessible to scientific investigation than any other region of the universe. 
So our telescopes may go further and further into the depths of space, but how can we ever obtain certain knowledge of what's hidden beneath those substantial barriers? What appliance can pierce through the outer layers of a star and test the conditions within? Now, Eddington had an answer. He didn't pose this without reason. He said theory, right? We know the laws of physics, or we think we know the laws of physics. We think they're generally applicable. So theory was what you actually had to turn to. Uh, but we can make measurement. He'd have been fascinated by actually what we can do. So the smart title for um, the study of the sun is Helioseismology, a mixture of Greek and Latin roots, if we have some classical scholars here, which really annoys some people. Um, but it's essentially the study of the interior of the sun using resonant modes, and that's where sound is going to come in. So essentially, I can think of the sun as like a three-dimensional musical instrument. And the picture there shows you an artist's impression of what some of the standing waves associated with those oscillations could be. So you can see that um, the coloured regions which are, if we think of them as a Doppler effect, um, are s bits of the sun coming towards you and bit bits going away from you, um, that they, as shown here, are not covering the whole sun. And that's just because I've chosen a mode that doesn't sense the whole sun. I could have chosen a different mode and it would be sensitive to different parts of the sun. And that's incredibly powerful. Now, one of the things you need to remember here, and remember it for when I move on to talk about distant stars, is that uh, the detail here on the surface is really quite fine. And because the sun is a nearby star, we can resolve its surface and put many pixels across the surface, and then you can actually image this kind of behavior. When we come to distant stars, then that is not possible yet. Someone might manage to do it, but at the moment, we, we can't see these complex objects, complex patterns. I can think about this as trajectories of sound rays, just like I can think about um, light waves. Um, and you can see that the patterns that I've drawn on here, uh, this one is skipping all the way around the surface. This one is going in deeper. So they're seeing diff sensing different volumes, which is what I said. But you could also see that this one here <coughs> that goes many times to the surface is one of the ones that is not going in very deep. And this one here that's going in somewhat deeper is coming back to the surface less often. So there's basically a trade-off. If you want to see deep inside your object, then you are looking at patterns that are not very complex on the surface. And that's in some ways quite convenient, uh, but the key property here is differential penetration. Different modes are sensitive to different parts of the volume, and that's going to, we'll see that that's a very, very powerful tool. Okay, so we want to study the sun. Where do we collect data? Well, there's one place. Uh, if anyone here is familiar with Birmingham, this clock tower was put up as public time, actually. Um, can be seen from a very long way away. Uh, we've also used a bit of, um, I shouldn't say artistic license, not, that's not quite accurate, but we've made our own stuff look big, all right? Um, so that's very tall. And this would fit comfortably inside this room. It's uh, a 12 foot American, so imperial, a 12 foot dome built for the American amateur market. And we can therefore afford it. Um, there are all sorts of stories you could tell about putting this up. The building it's on is a Victorian listed building, so the mortar has to be right. We have to have Victorian mortar in it. They also wouldn't allow us to align it north-south because the building is about two, three degrees off north-south. So our mount inside is aligned correctly, but it's very slightly skew. Um, so this is absolutely wonderful for testing and so on. Very convenient, but that's more like Birmingham. Okay, so if you want to study the sun, you have to go to places where the sun routinely shines. Uh, that does cause a certain amount of um, interest in the department when you talk about going to Tenerife, Hawaiian Islands, you know, 
They're, uh, they're places everybody knows about. Actually, we're no longer in Hawaii, but um, come on. We run an autonomous network around the world. So um, there's our Birmingham site. So um, California, that's above Los Angeles in the San Gabriel Mountains, <coughs> a very historically important observing site. We're at the top of a tower. Um, we're in Chile, Las Campanas, actually on an American site, because when we went there, the UK was not part of the European Southern Observatory, and therefore we, they wouldn't have us in. But the Americans would have us if we paid money, so we went to the American site. South Africa, Zania is Tenerife, and then East, uh, East and West Australia. Uh, we did used to be in the Hawaiian Islands, but for various... Well, political reasons, basically, someone much bigger than us was prepared to pay a lot more money for the site. So we, we moved and moved to Mount Wilson. So you can see that we are Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. We're in sort of mid-latitudes where um, the weather is reasonable, is good. Um, you might ask, well, why don't you go to the South Pole or perhaps the North Pole where you get continuous coverage? But that's actually... Uh, it's continuous when the sun is up, but it's bad when the sun isn't, and the sun is also very low. So the sites are chosen to give us a reasonable coverage. Um, we want to network so that the sun doesn't set, right? Because the nature of the sun is it's up for a while and it's gone for a while. And if you want a good data set, then you want it to be continuous. Now, we don't quite achieve continuous with um, six sites, but we do get somewhere in well over 80% over a year. And often we'll have more than one site, two or perhaps even three sites running at a time, um, and we have various ways of combining data, choosing the best site, whatever is appropriate for um, the sites that we're actually combining. All these are autonomous, which means they run under their own control. Um, they have a, a very ordinary computer running them. You don't need fancy computing power. What you do need is ability to outthink nature faults, um, the various SODs laws that turn up. Um, so we do an awful lot of condition monitoring we try and anticipate what goes wrong, so we look for signatures. Um, you have to clear out the birds from time to time. You have to make your electronics boxes mouse-proof, because mice love nice warm electronics. Um, the high altitude sites, and, and the, the uh, one in Chile is very characteristic of that. Ultraviolet rots cabling, so uh, you have to choose your cabling carefully. Uh, you have to be able to measure wind so that when, the, say, in Western Australia, when there's a cyclone coming through, you close down before the cyclone comes through. Could you imagine a dome with an open window and a nice strong wind blowing? You know, you find it down the road. Um, so it's quite fun. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of um, low tech, but the whole combination is incredibly robust. And when we started several in 75, you know, other people started with us, and there's nobody else running. Essentially, um, it is small scale. It's run from a small group in Birmingham. It's a UK-funded facility, um, but it really is incredibly successful. Oops. The other thing you can do, obviously, is measure from space, and there are some space-based observations. Um, there's a long-running one that is vaguely similar to us, and there's also one that actually resolves the surface of the sun and can get these uh, modes that have very fine structure across the surface. We concentrate on the sun as a star and look only at the modes that penetrate deep into the core. So we're not really competitors. You need both sets of data to do the serious analysis. And um, if you want to look at other stars, stars other than the sun, then you can do it from the ground um, but it's much more tricky because there's a lot less light. So we have an aperture of perhaps that. You know, it's tiny, our telescope. You probably wouldn't even recognise it as a telescope. Whereas if you want to measure even other relatively nearby stars, you need a big collecting area. And therefore, that's much more expensive and um, tricky to do. 
So anyway, oscillations data. Um, the next is just to give you some sort of introduction as to what these normal modes are. So if you think of a string, you can pluck a string, uh, you, can, you can get its fundamental mode, and then you can pluck it in the center and get half that. You can move your point out and get three, and so on and so forth on um, harmonic structure. And the ideas in the sun are similar. Um, and I then sort of have to ask you a question. Um, you play a musical note, all right? So A or whatever. How do you tell whether it's coming from a double bass or a flute? I hear the right answer. Harmonics, overtones. Okay, so they do play the same <coughs> note, but the structure of the note, the sound of the note, has more than that very basic fundamental note in it, and therefore it sounds very different. And it tells you information, the harmonic structure gives you information about what you're actually hearing it from. So, you can glaze over this if you want, but I'm going to use a bit of the notation, so I should at least tell you. So the sun oscillates as a three-dimensional body, which means that you have a spatial part on the surface and you have a radial part. And the spatial part is described by what we know as spherical harmonics, to do with the sphere, very classical. And there are two letters that describe um, the, the behavior, the appearance on the surface. So you don't have to worry about them, but you will see L on my pictures. And L equals zero is the very simplest breathing mode, in and out. In and out. L equals one uh, is beginning to look like a dumbbell. So is the next one up. And I can't do L equals two, but you can imagine it's sort of squashed in one direction and pushed in the others. And then the others become much more tricky to describe. And then the radial order is just the number of nodes. It's like the string. OK, how many oscillations, how many cycles did I have in the length of the string? That's sort of what N is. So there's a picture of how the sun oscillates. You can see I've put some L values on it. So, oh, whoops, sorry, wrong, wrong button. L equals naught, L equals one, L equals two, and L equals three. All right, so the very simplest breathing mode, and then the next few more complex ones. The other ones are present, but we average them out, so we just don't see them. Um, and you can see that they group in pairs, so the even ones are together, and the odd ones are together. Um, if I look at three and one, they're very different in height, and that's just averaging. It's not that they're fundamentally stronger or weaker. It's just that you're taking something that's varying across the surface and averaging across it. So the more that an object, the more complex the pattern on the surface, the less you see when you average. So that, that's the only reason for that. Um, and... You'll see there's an L1 there, an L1 here, another one over there. Those are equivalent to, if you think, equivalent to the different orders. So if you think of a string with four cycles in it, you would have one there, one there, one there, one there. Okay, so for the sun, we're up at, I don't know, this one about 25, 26. Okay, so there's lots of cycles before you get into the center. It's quite a high order oscillation. You can see that the signal to noise is amazing. You wouldn't argue whether or not those signals are there. When these were first done, nobody had thought that the sun would oscillate. OK, it was perfectly reasonable that there were sound waves, you know, that, that there was convection in the outer layer of the sun, and there was turbulence, and you know, that a kettle makes a noise as it comes to the boil. So you know, you know there are sound waves around. but. Nobody thought that these sound waves would travel all the way around the sun, all the way through the sun, and still be coherent with, still be in phase with, where it started from. So actually people took some convincing that this was real. What they thought was it was oscillations in the atmosphere above the observatory. And it took measurements from two sites uh, well distributed, so the Hawaiian Islands, I think, and um, Spain, not Tenerife, but uh, mainland Spain, 
and exactly in phase data was seen. They overlapped. And there was no way the atmosphere there knew anything about the atmosphere over here. And therefore, people understood that this really was the sun. But as I say, re absolutely revolutionary and controversial, hard to get funding for, because these are quite small signals. The sun oscillates at about a meter per second. At the time in astronomy, people thought that kilometers per second was a really, really good velocity measurement. To do one meter per second was just crazy. People would, you know, research grants were being thrown out, research applications, on the grounds that it was garbage and had to be proven to be real before anybody would really fund it. So the spacing between the L equal ones or a pair of L twos or a pair of L zeros gives you the mean density of the star, the sun in this case. And that's important when we go to look at um, planet hosting stars. And if you look at the separation between the close modes here, because the L0 goes all the way into the core and the L2 doesn't quite make it in, what we're sensing here is the energy generating core of the sun. So it's a very classical, simple measurement. You, you measure your acoustic spectrum <coughs> and you interpret what you've got in terms of these really important ideas for how the um, star actually behaves. I'm going to show you some stuff color-coded later on because, um, and I want to sort of introduce you to the concept. So if you imagine, I said this was around 25, 26 in terms of the order, and for the sun we might see 10, 15 orders. So I'd have to go round over there on the screen and off the screen rather and way over there and you'd get a bit bored. All right, so what we do is we color code, instead of having points that go up, we color code for intensity, and then we can cut up the strips and line them on top of each other. So you get pictures like that. So it becomes a two-dimensional picture. But each stripe on here is one order. This is actually data from a, um, a star, not the sun. And when we measure some of those, there's no L3, just from the way the measurement is made. So that's the L1, uh, L0, L2. Um, the, the sort of lozenges that you see are an artifact because the, the resolution in that direction is massively more than the resolution in that direction. But you, you spread them out to make the picture look reasonable. And this, <laughs> these spots on here are actually when we've gone through and measured what the frequency of the actual mode is. But anyway, if you can remember that, the reason I needed is to make some comparisons later on. Um, and you'll see visually the differences, even if you haven't quite got your head around what, what these slices are about. OK, so back to the sun. Um, the core penetrating modes. Some years ago, uh, there was a real problem with the rate in which neutrinos were measured from the sun. And this was an, of enormous interest because um, if, we were, if the neutrino rate was, was wrong, then it had implications for what we thought was going on inside the center of the sun. And one of the ways in which people thought it was wrong is that particles that could be um, dark matter particles were pooling inside the gravitational field of the sun. And because they don't interact very much, they go around and they alter the internal temperature. And the particle physicists were saying to us, well, OK, you know, you're doing really well with your solar models, but not quite good enough. However, we managed to make a measurement which said you've got to believe solar theory. We actually do know what's going on inside. And we measured the small separation that I've just shown you and showed that any sensible model that put these dark matter particles inside it was so far removed from the un uncertainties that couldn't be right. At which point the particle physicists went away and thought again, and thought, ah, what if our neutrinos have a little bit of mass? That mass will interact with the mass of the sun, and wow, it'll take the one sort of neutrinos that were coming out of the sun and turn them into three sorts. Gosh, that's the fact we were missing. And that's the current thinking. Um, it was, you know, it was there for the thinking about, but you know when you're looking for something lost and you think it might be there so you don't really look properly over there? Because people 
at some level couldn't understand that the solar physics was actually very good, they wouldn't entertain the other ideas. So that was one of the um, triumphs. Um, and so our picture of the sun, which is largely informed by helioseismology, is there's a convective zone, the depth of which was actually measured using helioseismology. There's a radiative zone inside. In other words, radiation is the dominant transport. It's very quiet. It doesn't have convection in it. And then energy is generated in the center. And we now know that <coughs> the nuclear reaction rate calculation is not bad because of what helioseismology can tell you about the measurements really inside. Um, we can also measure rotation. Um, this is the second of the angular um, numbers that I gave you. Um, if you're up in this region here, you, you, sorry, you're looking for splitting. So the kind of thing that's a beat, if you're close in two frequencies in a guitar or something, and you tune it by looking for the beat frequency, then waves going one way travel, come at you with a diff very, so, appear differently if they're going that way or that way. And when you start up here, you fight about what the splitting is. If you go down here, you measure it with a ruler. And we do, we're more sophisticated than that, but you can measure it sort of with a ruler. And that showed us that the centre of the sun was going round at about the rate the surface is going round. We can actually do slightly better from that, and we can start to map what the rotation rate in the inside of the sun is. So this is colour-coded for rotation rate. Fast is red, slow is blue. And these are cuts at various different latitudes. Uh, so that's the equator, which is travelling quite fast, and then up to about 60 degrees, which is going much more slowly, as a function of depth inside the sun. This is without the core penetrating mode, so you can't go down about below about half the solar radius, which is what's here. But you can see that um, it's, if you sort of take the yellow one there at mid latitudes, it's roughly constant on a radius. Yeah? Actually, that was counter to theory. When I was a young postdoc, um, new to this field, I said to a very eminent theorist, um, what, what should the rotation rate look like inside? And he said, oh, it's obvious, Yvonne, it's on cylinders. If you think about cylinders rotating, you know, you'd think that, well, they'll get dragged around together and they're all the same distance. Any one cylinder is a constant distance from the center. It's obvious. I thought, okay, stay quiet. Um, but he was wrong. What they'd left out was the Coriolis force, the force that moves the, the winds, um, the force on a more child level, if you try to walk, as I did as a child, around roundabouts and try to walk radially and get thrown sideways, they'd left out the Coriolis force, not because they didn't know it, but because they thought it didn't matter. And theorists always have to make assumptions because real life is too complicated. Um, there's a fancy name given for that where they all join together. Um, and if you want to know what the whole of the sun is doing, then... Um, that's the cylinders. Um, you have to put in the low degree modes and essentially the rotation and the differential rotation, in other words, different latitudes doing different things, is fundamental to the generation <coughs> of the magnetic field on the sun. So that's my next topic, is the magnetic field on the sun. So here is a sunspot uh, taken from a satellite called Hinode. At the time, there was just one big spot. I'll show you the current data, or at least two or three days ago data. Um, you can see, obviously, there's a very dark center, which is magnetic field stopping the motion. And you can see the granulation pattern around. Uh, very beautiful pictures taken. I think that's actually a ground-based picture, but taken um, what's called lucky imaging. So you throw away all the blurred ones. You take them rapidly and throw away all the blurred ones. Okay, so sunspots. Oops, my bit's not quite pointing at the sensor. Okay, so a long time ago, <coughs> someone called you Johan Fabricus observed spots and saw that they moved. 
and interpreted it as rotation of the surface. So that was one of the very early measurements of the rotation of the surface of the sun. And in those days, you didn't publish in Nature or whatever. You wrote a letter to your mate saying, I've seen rotation on the surface of the sun. And Shiner, who just seems such a perfect, what's the name for it? Well, your, job, your name follows your job. Um, he was actually a Jesuit priest. Um, and Galileo observed also, and got into some trouble, if you know your history. Um, but they also showed that there was a dearth of spots at a particular time between about 1645 and 1715. And Herschel, also great fame, took the current high-quality data, which happened to come from Adam Smith, um, and showed that the high grain prices correlated with a spot-free sun. There's also a wonderful um, um, graph that I can't actually find now, which was published in Nature in the 70s, which essentially was designed to tell you how misleading correlations can be. And it was produced by a German group, and it had the number of live births on the horizontal axis, because great interest in population, and the number of nesting storks on the vertical axis. <laughs> and there was a beautiful correlation. So not all correlations are what you actually think. But anyway, these ones did stand up. Um, so there was a, a cycle discovered, and, he, and the RAS was obviously well-founded by then and gave them a gold medal for the work. And then Carrington um, essentially measured the position of the spots and gave us a timing frame. So we now talk about Carrington rotation, whatever it is, and we've counted from when Carrington said that's when zero is. Carrington's work stopped when he had to go back to the family business. And Carrington's brewery? Yeah? I think his father died and he was required to stop playing with all this nice astronomy and go and run, go and make some money. Okay, so they showed that the number of sunspots varies with time. Um, there's actually a magnetic cycle of 22 years, but if we count spots, we just see that as 11 years. Um, well known, and actually five, six years ago, you'd have said you understood what was going on. No problem. We're building up to a nice big set of cycles, fantastic. But then we had a solar minimum that was incredibly quiet, no spots for 50 days in a row, and um, incredibly um, long. And we have another measure which is commonly used, which is the radio signal from the sun at 10.7 centimetres, and that also... Um, showed this very long extended minimum with a few bits of glitches in it, but very long and very extended. The conditions have picked up. We're actually through solar maximum, and I'll show you some counts in a minute. But this is a picture taken from a few days ago. Um, so uh, that's a site which has very good stuff on it. If anyone wants it, that's where this comes from. Um, as required for solar maximum, the spots are all relatively near the equator. They migrate as the solar cycle evolves, and all the regions get numbered because people study them. They study how they evolve, what they throw off, which is obviously very important for um, space weather. And those sunspots are all well correlated with strong magnetic fields, as we saw before. Um, in other words, the magnetic fields inhibit the convection from down below. So there's not as much heat flowing in, so they look colder. I think it was Herschel who, when he first saw it and saw them as black, actually, they couldn't measure what the temperature was. They did, these are about 4,000 Kelvin, right? Really hot, 4,000 centigrade almost. Um, he thought they might be quite cool. He actually thought they were caves that you could see into, and that maybe if you got, well, you might need a little bit of um, specialist clothing and so on, a little bit of adaptation, but, you know, great place to go and live. Sun always shines, you know. <laughs> um, you'll also clearly know about one of the earthly manifestations of activity from the sun, the energetic particles that come off, and <coughs> the aurora. So this is a picture from some time ago, actually, of the auroral oval, um, and also showing you that the uh, geographical North Pole and the um, geomagnetic North Pole are not co-located. But we care about what this activity is for reasons of satellites, and I'm sure you're, you're well um, versed on why we care. So 
here's a picture or a graph uh, which has date across the bottom here. So that's the minimum in 2009, 89, uh, previous maximum, and this maximum. And you can see these data come, they're, they're monthly values. Um, they're a month or two out of date, but not far wrong. It's the 3rd of March. So about a month, it takes a while to do a monthly average. Uh, and you can see this double hump structure, which is actually um, quite well known. We've actually measured that the oscillation data, and I'll show you in a minute, has a double hump structure at minimum as well. But it's not seen in the sunspot number. Um, and if you look at the height, and if, if you looked at a graph of predictions, you'll see that as we got closer and closer to the maximum, the predictions were going down and down and down. So we're actually in a state where the sun is very similar to what it was about 100 years ago. So not only is there this 11 or 22 year cycle, but there are very much longer term cycles. It's the first time in the satellite age and the electronic age where we've actually been able to measure the sun in this state. So it's actually incredibly exciting. From being something like, well, okay, there's another solar cycle, so what? It's been, we can really begin to understand what might drive the cycle, what sets the period of it, what sets the strength of it. Now, we're a long way off, but it's, um, it's something that we can begin to try and think about. Come on. Okay. What am I not pointing at? Oh, yeah. If we look back over time, you can see um, the so-called Maunder Minimum, which is where Galileo noticed the absence of spots. So I think you can now see in that that there is an envelope, a periodic envelope. We don't actually know whether we're heading into a Maunder Minimum or whether this will just be a minimum like 100 years ago. <coughs> we care, we care passionately actually, because it has huge impact on weather. Now they're only beginning to be able to produce models that talk about the transport of the solar <coughs> signal from the upper atmosphere through to the weather level. It may well be due to actually ultraviolet light from the ultraviolet and x-ray light out of the sun. In other words, something that really is very energetic. But it's clear that there are good correlations, <coughs> particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, so us, Northern Hemisphere Europe, with sunspot numbers and weather. You can look at things like runs and cricket, the raspberry crop. Um, there are a lot of... Anyone index on its own, you'd think, no. Nah. You know, it's like stalks and live births. It's, it's not sensible. But... There does appear to be some really good phenomenological evidence, and as I say, the climate modelers are now beginning to say a little bit more. The sun's intensity does change with the solar activity, but it's by a very small amount, 0.1% or so. So it's not clear that that driving is what matters. It is actually believed to be the activity. So activity is actually pretty important for um, actual life um, on, on um, planets. OK, so that's the surface view. I said we can measure below it. So I'm going to show you some old data and then some new data just to show you quite what um, scientific inferences are drawn on. Uh, so what we're going to see is that the frequencies of the modes increase with solar activity. So I'm going to take some datum period and say, OK, I've got a whole series of frequencies. That will be my datum. And then I'll look at what they are at a later time. I'll subtract those two and average them. And that'll give me one number for that time. OK, and we believe that it's the near surface that matters. The changes that we see are about one second in the sound travel time in the sun. So it takes about 6,000 seconds for the light to travel, sound to travel through the sun. And we see changes at, well, slightly more than 0.1%. So it's pretty tricky measurement. in something that's not got that good signal to noise. And there's good but not perfect correlation with indices, which is also interesting. OK, and come on, give me a graph. I'm not quite good. Right, so these, this is the early nature data. So time, shift, and this one is the same thing, but correlated with sunspot number rather than time. And 
the thing you really want to take, and, and through there is plotted the sunspot number. So we, we agonised over this. Okay? We knew that we had a trend here. Well, we knew we had data here, but the data quality are not brilliant. That was long before we had a network, a couple of sites measuring in the summer. You know. So we knew we had a bit of a trend down there, but what we needed to do was to see the cycle reverse and watch the signal reverse with it because only then had we got confidence that what we were seeing was real. And when we saw it reverse, we thought, yes. But you can see that, you know, particularly when you plot it like that, well, there's a trend, but, you know, you'd be prepared to argue about it. That's the modern data. So when I put you in a network, uh, improve the quality of the instrumentation, much better fill, you wouldn't argue. It's all perfectly there. And there's the little blip in the solar data, it's not as strong as the blips at maximum, but it's clearly happening. We think there's actually flux trapped below the surface that just doesn't make it through at minimum. But somehow it's carried up by the large-scale field, and when that large-scale field is, is gone away at solar minimum, then the oscillations are sensing something below the surface, but it's not making it to the surface. Time will tell whether we're right. We've... Oh, We've watched it interestedly through this minimum, and this, as I say, is very long, and actually the correlation with the indices uh, got terrible. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done in understanding. I ought to move on. Um, OK, so um, I can map the interior, or at least other people can map the interior of my data, to be precise. Um, and you know the ideas of CT scans and so on, so you take a lot of pictures from a different, at different angles, and then you do a lot of mathematics, you invert the problem and get a picture. So that's the idea behind mapping the sun with all these different sound waves where all the oscillations have a slightly different cavity. So I can measure the sound speed or the fractional change in the sound speed with, compared to a model. If I just to show you the sound speed, it would look lovely, but you wouldn't learn anything. So you can see that uh, if the model and the data agreed perfectly, it would be along that dotted line, dashed line. Um, you can see that um, the changes are better than 0.1%, probably. And hence why we were confident about our neutrino problem. But they're absolutely significant. And actually, it's unsolved at the moment as to where they come from. One possibility was that the composition of the sun isn't quite right. And there was some lovely data produced some time ago that said we've got the amount of carbon and nitrogen, um, oxygen, neon wrong. Sadly, it makes everything worse. <laughs> Solves some other problems, actually, um, for other sorts of variables, but it makes things worse. Probably what's happening is that we've got two mistakes, or the theory has two mistakes, in it, or three or four, and they've compensated because they know that helioseismic data are so good, you make sure you agree with it. And then you change one of the parameters and you discover that you know, it wasn't quite right. But this is um, still driving research. This is not a solved problem. It's improved a bit. They've actually dropped down the uh, abundance changes a bit, but there's still a discrepancy. OK, so I want to use the last few minutes to talk about other stars. Loads and loads and loads of stars oscillate. And they have various cosmological interest, um, but what... Um, I'm interested in is the stars that are driven by convection in the outer layers. So um, there's my a, a sunspot again. We have this convection. Uh, if stars have outer layers of convection, they drive sound waves through the interior. And the data sent to come from uh, that I'll show you will come from the Kepler mission. It was um, made. It looked at the same area of sky. Oops. There we are, up in Cygnus. I've got some amateur astronomers, a southern con uh, sorry, a summer constellation. Many of the pros, <coughs> the professionals who use the Kepler data, don't actually know where Cygnus is. It's quite interesting. You go out and say, look, it's up there. Um, slightly away from the Milky Way, because the Milky Way is too dense, to put too, too many stars to separate them out, and you want to be able to separate out the individual stars. So that's where Kepler looks. Um, the, 
I, sa I said to the, um, the separation and the frequencies told you about mean density. Basically, we're looking at the sound travel time. So a um, very ancient piece of work, 1880 in German, um, tells you that the fundamental period of oscillation depends on the square root of 1 over the square root of the mean density. So if I can measure that separation, I can tell you something about the mean density, as I showed you for the sun. Uh, it's equivalent to switching off gravity. That's what we mean by, oh, sorry, switching off um, the restoring force of the pressure and allowing gravity to take over. So the sun would collapse under that sort of time scale. If you get to supernovae um, and switch off the restoring force, that collapses in milliseconds. The sun would take about an hour. So these are various stars. So that's a star like the sun. You can see that the central frequency, that's the sun. Frequencies in microhertz. I'm sorry, they're very un... You know, not what you're used to seeing, but divide a hertz by 10 to the 6 and you get microhertz. And you can see it's very similar to what the sun does. And we have a few musical instruments. Come on, talk to me. There we are. Um, I can't tell you which ones they are, but one of you might be able to. Um, so if I go to something that's a bigger star, bigger instrument, then the oscillation frequency goes down. And there aren't many, actually, that we get, but if we go to smaller stars, then the oscillation frequency goes up. So not only are we looking at the separation, but the central frequency as well is fundamental to what tells us about the interior of the star. Actually, the central frequency here tells you about the local conditions for gravity, the surface gravity of the uh, star. Oops. Did I miss one? No. Okay, so as stars age, as they burn their hydrogen to helium, they grow. So how will our sun evolve? Well, we can take from the Kepler data a sequence of spectra from st different stars now that have about one solar mass. Right? So this is a way of seeing the future for our sun. And there's the spectra. So we're moving from something around 3,000 down to something around 500 or so microhertz down there. Now this labelling actually comes from my colleague, but, uh, <laughs> you know. So we are able, by studying a variety of stars, to actually understand what will happen to our sun in time. Kepler was actually designed to look for planets. Right? It wasn't designed to do astro-stellar seismology. We got the chance to do it because actually a Danish group got together a big consortium and said, we can tell you about the central stars. So let me show you how Kepler data work. So Kepler works by measuring what's called transits. So as a planet moves in front of the surface of the star, it blocks out some of the light, so you get a little dip in the amount of light that comes out. The size of the dip depends on the fraction of the area you've blocked. So what it tells you is the relative size of the planet to the star. It doesn't tell you the absolute size. So what the astroseismologist said to NASA was, we can tell you the absolute size of the star because the same quality data, the same data that you need to find transits, we can do seismology on. Actually, for you, it's noise. For us, it's signal. And they were convinced, and it's a very expensive mission, and a European consortium, of which there are some leaders in Birmingham, um, got free access to the data because we could deliver. To give you some ideas, there's Jupiter, 1% of the area of the sun, um, the Earth or Venus is 0.01%, um, and um, the uh, fractional parts per million blocked um, are given there as well. So we need really good quality data to make these measurements. So here's some Kepler data. So I'm going to show you some stuff from Kepler very quickly. Um, so Kepler 36, they all get numbered. Um, so we have an approximately Earth-sized planet there pretty small, and Neptune-sized planet out here. Um, we only know they're Earth-sized and Neptune-sized because in this lot are oscillations. 
So we have the spectra. Um, this is one of the really exciting ones, uh, Kepler-21. So it's a rocky planet. You can tell that if you can, get, you can get the mass and the radius, you can find the density, and you know that that's likely to be rock then. Um, the star itself is a little bit more evolved than the sun and a bit more massive than the sun. It's an F star, if uh, you're interested. Um, and you can see the frequencies are lower. And those frequencies are what are giving us the sizes. Um, one that caused a huge amount of excitement was a system with many stars in it, sorry, many planets in it, and one of them is smaller than Mercury. Um, you can see that the data quality here, the star is quite faint. Uh, it's getting quite tricky. It's nothing like the early stuff that you saw, but it's perfectly analyzable for the separations. I wouldn't care to pick out all the individual frequencies, but I can give you the repetitive structure that's inside it. And so we can say to them, we've got something smaller than Mercury, uh, very dense as well. Okay, so daisy. So what we want is the so-called Goldilocks zone. We want rocky planets in a habitable zone. And the seismology is what enables NASA to say that's that we probably have some. There aren't all that many. Most of the things they find, planets they find are close in, hot Jupiters, not expected actually, and very interesting in their own right. <coughs> Okay, so my new and pet topic, but I'm running out of time, um, red giants. So red giants are what the sun will become. Uh, an HR diagram, the luminosity is a function of temperature. They set up here, very bright. Kepler used them to do position sensing astrometry and couldn't rule them out with its photometry. So rather than risk cutting out a lot of um, stars like the sun, it allowed them to come in. So we have... I don't know, 16,000 of these things. And it turned out that um, they are very powerful. So if I remind you about the spectrum I showed you before and show you by comparison what a red giant one is. Now, if you can't remember how it's done, don't worry about it. But I think you'll see that there's lots and lots of modes in here, orders in here. The red giant one doesn't have anything like the number of orders. The... I've got this written down. Um, the mean frequencies at which they oscillate are much lower because they're much bigger. They're actually very strong oscillations as well. Tricky to do from the ground because the periods are hours. Right? The sun from the ground is easier because five minutes, which is uh, 3,000 microhertz, is easier. Okay, so what we really want to know with the red giants is what's going on inside them. Right, I've got two pictures for you to look at there. Oh, and we need to try and characterize them phenomenologically. Right? If, you were to describe, if you were to describe to somebody what you thought the features were there, you know, if um, you were down a phone line or whatever, all right, and you couldn't see the pictures. I think it would be fair to say that this one is much cleaner, that um, there are two clear stripes in this one, uh, and then much finer stripes on the right-hand side, and this one looks a mess. They probably have the same sort of extent. They're not quite the same frequency, but they're very close. They've probably got the same sort of extent in the vertical direction, but they are very different in character. And what we've discovered is that those, that character, and they're known as mixed modes, they're not just modes which are have pressure, have sound wave restoring forces, but they also have buoyancy. And they're going into the absolute core of the star. So by looking at those, I can tell you whether or not the star has burnt all its hydrogen to helium in the centre and has started to burn helium. That is one of the great challenges of studying stellar evolution. If I've got an acoustic spectrum, I can virtually just look at it and say, that's helium burning. And that is one of the huge successes. You can also measure the rotation rate inside. I told you for the sun, it was pretty much what the surface is doing. For these guys, they're going around very fast. So there has been an evolutionary process which has contracted the cores and expanded the envelopes. And we can now map what's happening to the angular momentum, the rotation rate, as a function of time. Again, that puts a constraint on theory that's been absent up to now. 
for all theorists. So it's a phenomenally exciting time. The sun is exciting, and, what's hap and what we can understand about what's happening inside stars is also very exciting. Larson had a view that this is what was inside the sun. Uh, I tell my students it's not quite right. They're supposed to get up in the morning. Um, and so thank you very much. Well, ladies and gents, we have uh, a few minutes for some questions. And the roving micro microphone will go round. So who is going to be the first questioner? Yes. Uh, I was very interested in your um, observations about the possibility of another Maunder minimum um, and the fact that uh, climate uh, climatologists are beginning to look more closely about the whole... Um, it's sometimes said they've been slow to do so because of reluctance to appear off message. Do you think that's a fair criticism? Because they're, they're what? Reluctance to appear off message. I think it is a problem um, because there was no mechanism. You know, the solar activity, it's clear that the, or at least I think it's clear, I'm not a climate modeler, that the 0.1% change in the luminosity is not enough. Mm. Uh, and there was no mechanism for the transport. Um, and therefore, it was hard to see why it mattered. And there, were, there was more than one camp. I mean, there's places when I've talked given, you know, professionally about um, possible impact and people have looked at me and said, no way. But you go somewhere else and they say, yeah, 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 very sensible. So I think it's, people think science is all done in straight lines and they don't actually understand how controversial everything is when it starts. If it were dead easy, we'd all have solved it. Which is partly why I showed you the early solar data, which, you know, was, people disagreed. Yeah. So, so yeah, absolutely. I got the impression from one or two phrases you use that there's not an automatic sharing of the raw data that's discovered. Only the particular example you gave one was where it was, I think you'd mentioned something about because we could deliver. Um, is, is, there, is there a hoarding of raw data as opposed to results? In the long term, no. Um, in the short term, uh, when the Kepler mission went up, um, because to see transits, you need to see them once and again and again, um, NASA um, kept their data to allow its own scientists time to make observations. And we were given access but had to promise not to find planets. You know, if we found them, we had to yeah, <laughs> close our eyes, tell NASA. Um, the data are now all public, open access. Um, it's, it's, um, there's obviously an argue, a discussion you can have about this. Um, but if you're an instrument builder, you put a huge amount of effort into putting the thing up. And if someone just sits there and creams the results, you get no more funding. Yeah? Uh, but on the other hand, it's publicly funded research, and therefore it should be publicly available. So that there is a trade-off and a balance. Um, and actually, the American seismology community was somewhat annoyed by Kepler because we, as Europeans, we were getting it, but they weren't getting funded. They had to join us to gain access which caused a certain amount of bad feeling. <laughs> but it's now all open access. Mm -hmm. So you can look if you want. <laughs> Try it over there, yes. Okay. Your write-up says well, all this is classical physics that you're doing, but the, uh, the, the sun is really a big plasma ball, isn't it? Yeah. And Plasmas are not really classical physics. Well, they're the fourth state of matter, so maybe they are. But essentially, um, the, the, the statement about classical physics is that what is really that it's propagation of sound waves that underlies yeah. all the results, and that's what the statement means. Yeah, but the motion within the, uh, uh, the sun, within the plasma, uh, which uh, uh, gives rise to the sound waves, is going to be much more complicated than in... Um, <clears throat> the classical sort of gas theory with lots of uh, billiard balls colliding and so on. I um, mean, there, there'll be a whole lot of uh, um, electrical currents, in effect. You're partially right and partially 
not quite right, if you forgive me. Um, <laughs> That's why I asked the question. <laughs> the, what you have to ask is how the magnetic fields will inhibit the motion. Okay, so what you have to ask is what the relative size of the pressure due to the magnetic field and the gas pressure. So if you're in the very outer layers, absolutely, they are magnetoacoustic waves and really quite tricky to analyse. But you don't have to go very deep into the sun before the magnetic field strength is not believed to be significant because the gas pressure goes up so rapidly. So that it's a perturbation, it's a small effect, and therefore to first order you can totally neglect it. Um, one might, though, argue that um, magnetic fields, you know, Maxwell and so on, are certainly not quantum physics. Um, and therefore, you know, it's probably within the framework of classical physics. But, but it's because the sound pressure, the, the acoustic pressure, is dominant through most of the sun. That's the basis of the simple calculations. And most magnetic analysis uh, doesn't allow for compressibility. Well, you can't squash it. So, um, actually, we would love people to do a bit more for the outer regions on joining the two. Well, we are uh, running uh, dangerously and thrown <coughs> Sorry. out, but I will allow one more question, maybe somewhere over this side of the audience. Or somewhere right at the back? Right at the back, yes, yes, thank you. Can I ask you, how does dark matter affect your seismology readings? Um, the idea is that um, dark matter particles must interact quite weakly. Okay, so they whiz through the Earth. But the sun's gravitational field is reasonably strong. So the idea is that there's a potential well. There's somewhere where they can pool, where they can gather in the centre of the sun. OK. How do, how do, does it, is it picked up by your seismology reading? Well, what we pick up is the temperature. So we don't pick up the dark matter, okay. but we look at the temperature distribution through the sun. Or the models pick it up. And the sound speed depends on the density and uh, the temperature. So if you have dark matter particles that are not interacting and a particle goes from there to way over there, it takes its knowledge of its temperature with it. Okay. Whereas if it's only travelling a tiny distance, then the temperatures are unequalised over a very small distance. So the idea is if you have these particles in, which don't interact very much, they even out the temperature distribution in the centre of the sun. And that's what the models could rule out. So it's not a direct measurement at all, it's the impact of the particles. So it's a very good question. Okay, thanks. Thank you.